Now, it's been said, right, in a headline recently, that you believe that the U.S. has already lost the war on AI. So we, I don't believe that we have lost. What I said is that if we don't act now and don't wake up right away and not in five to ten years from now, unlike some, some of the Pentagon reports are saying, but if we don't take a stand now and take action, we have no fighting chance in succeeding uh, 10 to 15 years from now because um, with AI, the velocity of adoption of AI compounds over time. And so effectively, you're going to be at a situation at some point where you pass the point of no return. You will not be able to catch up. So um, when we say we have 10 years, or when we say in 10 years, China is going to be leading, first of all, it's wrong because China is leading right now. They're already leading in many of those fields because of the adoption uh, of the technology from their companies. Uh, that's the difference when you compare with the U.S. side, where really at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. companies are leading against China, but we do not have access to that technology. So that puts us behind because effectively we're left uh, not being able to partner and competing at the same time with a massive country with 1.5 billion people that are not waiting for us to wake up. Well, a country that also likes to steal a lot of technology, especially, you know, technology which can be found online in some way in the cloud. Uh, you know, there's, there's constant reports of Chinese regime hacking efforts, very successful efforts. We know, for example, that parts of the you know next generation fighter plane were obtained uh, by by China. There's many many examples of this. Let's start here. AI. What is AI, and how does it play into the Department of Defense and the military, and why is it important, and why is this particular issue so paramount? So. Artificial intelligence is going to be what is going to make or break us in the next years to come. Uh, because effectively what AI can do is uh, making decisions for you, accelerating the access to information, coming to conclusions that the human brain cannot even comprehend. It can also uh, drastically automate access to data and, and tracking data and, and, and be used to, for example, uh, track satellite imagery so we can detect objects and what's going on, which can potentially prevent loss of lives. We've seen it recently in Afghanistan. Potentially with better AI, we could have recognized that inside this car was seven kids, and, and you could have known that proactively through automation. So, so effectively, it enables us to do much more uh, by adopting artificial intelligence at scale across industries. And you see it across, uh, around us everywhere from text to speech when you can speak to your phone like Siri or, or Amazon and, and tell Alexa, you know, wh what you want to uh, eat for dinner and it's going to propose different locations, right? All the, these technologies are driven and based on AI. And without AI, they could not exist. And so AI allows us to make decisions faster, but it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Yes. You can also take an example where recently we have uh, a challenge with DARPA, uh, which is the, the Defense Research Lab, where uh, we demonstrated that we could um, uh, have a dogfight, right? So two jet fighters fighting together and have one of the jets uh, completely flown by AI and the other by the best Air Force pilot and every single time the, the human lost. Um, and, and that's, I would argue, is not even the most advanced AI capability that there is on the planet. So it's going to change drastically the way we think, we do business, the way we even build weapons, because effectively if you know that um, those jet fighters will not be able to compete, what's the point in even investing more into the fifth generation fighters or sixth generation fighter when you have to drastically rethink the way you're going to design them, man them, train people to use them, and what really the, the, the end goal of these capabilities, particularly also when you start combining cybersecurity to it with cyber offense, where you can take an entire grid system or an entire system down without even leaving your, your living room. You're saying you had a fully automated AI driven, driven jet fighter beat the equivalent jet fighter manned by a human being every single time, every single test. That's correct. Um, yeah, that for a lot of us, I think that's still the realm of science fiction, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's not. Why are you so sure that the Chinese Communist Party is ahead of the U.S. right now 
in terms of AI development? So I can tell you we could change this by ensuring that the U.S. companies partner more with the Department of Defense. But by not being able to do that, effectively what we guarantee is that you know these Chinese companies have no choice but to work with the CCP. And effectively what you end up having is a situation where they get so much data. First, you're facing 1.5 billion people. So by definition, already based on numbers, you already are losing, right? Because they have more data and AI is, an, is, is a data game, right? The more data, the more access to data, the more you can uh, leverage rapid prototyping and rapid delivery of capabilities, right? And that's the other piece with uh, the cycle, right? AI learns upon itself. So the more you can deploy it rapidly, the more you can learn, the more it's going to be able to uh, accelerate its learning. And that's why time compounds and is exponential. And at some point you look back and you just have no ability to catch up. You're basically saying that the amount of available data to the system that's doing the learning is actually incredibly important to the speed at which it learns and uh, basically to its effectiveness. Yeah, and you see it with a US example like Tesla, right? The, the fleet that we have with these cars on the street is how the system gets better uh, weeks after weeks. And being able to send over the air update every two weeks allows Tesla to accelerate its learning, get better at it, and try new features, try new, a uh, better algorithm, see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, try with a subset of the fleet, try with 5% of the fleet, a new version, 5% with another version, see which one sticks. So the more um, uh, end users and the more data you get, the better the system becomes, and so it's exponential. So, and why for these military application AIs, right? Is the number of people available or the number of people's data available so important? Because effectively, um, to improve accuracy of the AI model, it's all about volume of data. So the more data you have, the more accurate and precise and effective this AI capability will be in making decisions, in detecting objects, in recognizing my French accent when I talk to Alexa. Right? All these things is effectively driven through that automation. And so, um, you know, despite the fact that the United States is spending more money than many other nations combined in defense, what we, we fail to recognize is that, I would argue when you compare what it costs to do the same capability on the commercial side, and I spent 20 years on the commercial side before joining the Department of Defense, and I, when I was estimating work, I would have to multiply by 10 the cost in DOD uh, because often that's just the way it costs to do business in the department. So effectively, when you spend a dollar, you get 10 cents of value, right, that you would get on the commercial side. So we're saying we're spending more money, but are we spending it wisely, effectively? Are we agile enough? Is our acquisition process broken? If we don't adopt agile methodologies that are 22 years old, I started at 15, 22 years ago, and I was implementing Agile at the time. And the US government has no Agile training to this day mandated for our acquisition workforce. Well, and this is very interesting. So tell us, explain to us what Agile means for the layperson. So Agile is what allows you to uh, become more efficient and be, be able to deliver continuous val value incrementally not having to follow this five-year cycle process where you plan for some things, you have requirements, you uh, plan it, and then you execute for multiple years before the, the capability comes to life in the hands of the warfighter or your end user. By adopting Agile, what you do instead is you uh, continuously deliver value, small incremental piece of value, so you can validate that what you're building makes sense for your customers, or the warfighter in my case. So they can test it, they can see if it makes sense, you can prioritize features, you can every two weeks decide that, hey, this feature is more important than this feature, so you can prioritize your work, you can be more efficient. So you end up effectively never being in a situation where you end up waiting five years all to learn that the billion dollar of taxpayer money was wasted because what we were building was built in a vacuum. That's really interesting. So this, I mean, it's a completely different philosophy of development, basically, like diametrically different. Yes. Yeah. But it has to be done thoughtfully because there's no like, you know, shipping at 80 percent here. Like you have to actually have something that functions if, as you said, warfighters are going to be using this. It's just that what the initial product is just going to be a piece, perhaps, of the final product. Correct. Is that 
that the idea? It, it, and that's also the big difference, right? You look at a SpaceX, right? SpaceX has 200 employees. You compare with F-35 that has 4, 200 developers and, and 4,000 developers with uh, F-35. Uh, SpaceX reuses 80% of, of its code across the nine platforms of SpaceX. So it's Lego blocks, it's modular, it's pieces of a puzzle. A platform, a new rocket, is never built from scratch. So the software is reused across and, and they can reuse pieces of these Lego blocks and put together a new platform just by swapping Lego blocks and trying different things. If you compare that with F-22 and F-35, F-22 F and F-35 are sharing 4% of the code base, 4%. There's no reuse, despite both of them being built by the same company, right? And that leads us to effectively being into what we call a monolithic architecture, right? It's very difficult to update. You're very much locked into this entire uh, system. You can uh, cut it, you can uh, reuse pieces. If you take a sensor on a jet, the same sensor could potentially be used on the ship, right? But that sensor effectively is built in a way that's so tied up to the system that you cannot do that today. If you were to build it right, like we do now with some of the initiative I pushed, you could actually cut the systems into pieces and start delivering these Lego blocks, mm. right? And share across services. There's a drastic waste of taxpayer money by not enabling reuse across the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army, where you see, um, often because of egos, honestly, and, and bureaucracy and silos, where um, these teams are alleging that the mission is different, but IT is IT. Right, and we need to be able to reuse capabilities. Not everything is going to be the same, but if, even if we were from four, four, from four percent to fifty, sixty, seventy percent, the imp the uh, um, improvement of that delivery and the ability to reuse and the cost savings associated to this will be dramatic. And, and that's why when I say you know we spend a uh, dollar, we get ten cent of value. That's part of the problem between the lack of agility, so we can continuously deliver value and see what sticks, between the silos and the waste, the lack of training, uh, and, and the lack of investment in our airmen and warfighters, so we can actually improve their knowledge of agile. There is no agile training. We built it uh, during my tenure, uh, but it was not mandated. The mandated training is still the legacy training.